Hello advanced algebra students and welcome back to another video lesson. Today uh, there's nothing easy to say except for buckle up, hold on tight and get ready because we're going into something that you've never probably ever learned about. Something that can be a little bit confusing at first but you just gotta go and work with it because once you understand and get it it's uh, second nature because it comes a little bit easier. So we're gonna work with imaginary numbers and we'll talk a little bit more about what those are now recall we have been working on solving um, these quadratic equations and trying to isolate x squared or even the absolute value problems um, but our first step here would have been to subtract 45 so that 4x squared would equal negative 16, 29 minus 45 is negative 16. When we divide by four, we get x squared equals negative four. And then we try to take the square root of that. And we have what is called no solutions because we can't take the square root of a negative four, a number times itself. Positive times positive, negative times negative. So we don't have any solutions yet. And that's where we introduce this concept of imaginary numbers. Now, there was a math mathematician, uh, Rene Descartes, who decided he was going to use the letter I to represent the square root of negative one. So he said, this letter I will equal the square root of negative one. And then he went on to prove why that would be true and why it works and some other things with that. However, what we need to do is take just a few more maybe accurate notes to help us understand how and why this works. By the way, this might be my summer do. Mustache, little soul patch and long hair. Maybe. Anyway, so from your packet in page five, for most of your mathematical life up until now, you've lived over here in this realm of what are called real numbers. Um, pi uh, being irrational, where there are decimals that don't end, or rational numbers that have very specific ending points. And what we learn is that there's also something called the complex number system, this is going to come more in lesson six nine that includes these imaginary numbers which we're going to talk about today and tomorrow and some of the things that go along with these imaginary numbers um, and so what really is happening in these right what happens when we try to solve x squared plus four is zero and that's what we just had at the end here we had x squared equals negative four and when we tried to do the square root we, we don't know a way quite yet how to figure that out. But what does that mean graphically, right? What does that actually mean graphically? And so I'm going to just take us over really quick to Desmos and show these two pieces on a graph. What do you think is going to happen? Well, hopefully, oh, I got the wrong Desmos for graphing. That's not going to work y equals x to the second plus a four so there's my graph of y equals x squared plus four and remember we're looking for when does y equals zero which is the line down here they're never going to intersect right i don't have any values that i can plug in here where they intersect and so we technically don't have any solutions graphically where we can see them on a graph which is where Descartes came up with this imaginary number system that gives us the meaning to the square root of negative numbers. This system of imaginary numbers is what allows us to, in a sense, take out an I, say there's an imaginary number there that exists, and that it's defined as I equals the square root of negative one. 
And then we can use some operations with that. Now, I, I know the name imaginary kind of makes it look and sound like that's just silly. What I mean, what really would we ever use that for? And there's a ton of real life applications, um, especially with some of the engineering principles and, and finding intercepts of arcs and circles. And it comes way later in other courses, and they'll talk about it more in depth, specifically related to calc and pre-calc. All right, but what we need to focus on are these two really, really big ideas, okay? The first thing that you need to just take my word for is that I equals the square root of negative one. Got to take my word for it. I equals the square root of negative one. The second thing comes from that. If I have I equals the square root of negative one, and I decide to square both sides. Well, that golden rule in math, if I square one side, I have to square the other. What happens on this right-hand side when I indeed square a square root? Well, the square root and that squared component cancel each other out. Therefore, I squared really equals negative one. So that's the other key piece that you really need to know. I equals the square root of negative one, but I squared equals negative one. And so we can use that information to kind of help us simplify negative square roots. And let me show you what I mean. Here's two examples that we're gonna try and just simplify. What I call straightforward, the square root of negative 121, and then the square root of negative 32. What we have said in the past is that we can't do this. This has no solutions. Now that we're going to introduce you to this imaginary system, we can, in a sense, we separate this. Remember, you know, way back, and I'm not even sure when, but when I we were looking at like the square root of 6 times the square root of 6. As long as they're both underneath the square root, we could say that that's the square root of 36, which is really just 6. The same concept happens here. What if I decided to change this to be the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 121? Okay, that's how I can get negative 121. What did we just say Descartes came up with for negative, a square root of a negative number? Well, that's this I. So we're going to replace it with I to say there's an imaginary there. And then what's the square root of 121? We're only going to work with that positive. Meaning we can say the square root of 121, I'm sorry, negative 121 is now 11I where I represents the imaginary system, okay? So we can take the square root of this number by really just pulling this negative out and making it I. For example, over here, I'm gonna take the negative out and put it outside saying I, and then I'm left with the square root of 32. Can we find the square root of 32? Like, is it easy to break down like 121? It's not, so we say that that is now simplified. I times the square root of 32. Why don't you try these two down here in the bottom and see what you get for these two. Okay, the square root of negative 81. Well, to get rid of the negative, we're going to bring the I outside and then do the square root of 81. But we know the square root of 81 is 9, so we say that this is now equal to 9i. 9i, I'm representing that imaginary system. Square root of negative 18, again, we take the i and bring it out front to represent that square root of negative 1 times the square root of 18. We don't know the square root of 18. There isn't a number times itself. That is that whole number. So we'll leave it as i times the square root of 18. And this becomes important now, as you'll see in the next slide, so that we can start to do some operations with them. But if, if you, again, you got to take my word for the fact that i equals the negative, the square root of negative 1. 
that that's what it equals. And again, I can rewrite some of these as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 81. That's an acceptable property, and then we replace that with i. Now we need to try, though, and, and think about, well, how does that, what does that imply, though, with, with how we, in a sense, use operations? Like, what can we do with this i when we're solving, when we're trying to figure out answers? So letter A here has 3i times negative 2i. We can treat this almost as if it's its own variable in a sense, right? If I asked you instead to do 3x times negative 2x, I think, and I'm hoping we could all say that that's negative 6x squared. So if we do that here, 3 and times negative 2 is still negative 6, but i times i is really i squared. And whenever you see i squared, we should replace an i squared with negative 1. That was that second really big item. And then we can simplify even further because negative 6 times negative 1 gives me positive 6. Positive 6. So anytime you see i squared, You've got to think to yourself that that's really negative 1. And again, that comes from this really big idea over here. That if I squared both of these pieces, I would get i squared as negative 1. Well, what does that do for us in this type of problem? Well, before I can find the square root of 144, I've got to take the i value out. Square root 144, which is... So 12i in this first part minus square root of negative 16. So I've got to take the i out times the square root of 16. But really, square root of 16 is 4i. So again, just like similar to this problem, if I had 12x take away 4x, many of you would be able to simplify that. We use that same philosophy down here. 12i minus 4i would leave me with 8i. And it's because we can take out that i value that allows us to all of a sudden simplify this problem even further. Okay, Square root of negative 10 times the square root of negative 10 couple different ways of attacking this one, but I can take this i value out times the square root of 10, take this i value out times the square root of 10, i times i becomes i squared. Square root 10 times square root 10 is the square root of 100, but the square root of 100 is really 10 times i squared, but remember that i squared, we just said, really is negative 1. So 10 times negative 1 is really negative 10. That's how we can prove that that's true. Last one, the square root of negative 400 all over 2. So I've got to take the i value out and then find the square root of 400, that is all over 2. But the square root of 400 is really 20, so 20i <clears throat> over 2. And if we can simplify the numbers when it's just being multiplied, we can certainly do it to show that we would get 10i. Now, again, I realize this is a brand new concept. It's like speaking a foreign language, perhaps, for the very first time. Uh, I can't encourage you enough to make sure that you're trying the practice problems today uh, that are assigned from the packet. And if you do indeed have any questions, you need to make sure that you reach out. We are going to review a lot of this in our live sessions on Thursday and Friday. Until next time, stay safe.